All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. All ready. I'm ready to go. Okay, so recently uh, some stressful and business-related issues have um, surfaced regarding yourself and your brother. I'm uh, wondering what is the latest on this situation with Bruce and other parties for you? Well, there's really been no change, um, as I was uh, explaining to everyone. Uh, You know, the situation uh, basically is very simple. Um, My brother and I worked together on Kiss Cruise 7. The response was really great. We decided we would get some merchandise together. Uh, I chipped in my share to get the design copyright, which was $1,500. I gave my brother $750. That's the $750 that's been referred to with all these people saying, well, they wouldn't need your money. That's not the way it works. Nobody's fronting money for us. We had to come up with the money ourselves, do it ourselves. So after the shirts were completed, There was a bad falling out due to, as I explained, the circumstance regarding my wanting to have a band with my brother and Todd Kearns and Brent Fitz, the band that played on Kiss Crew 7, that was an amazing band that had the magic that could have been, by this time, a successful band with original material. I don't want to play Kiss material. That was just a gig to show what the band could do. The material is irrelevant. We could have played... Beatles songs and it would have been no less seriously so my brother having declined (laughs) playing with me and these two guys decided he would just take those two guys Brent Fitz and Todd Kearns and add some guy and be a band replacing me I'm not replaceable so nothing has changed in that area Uh, I'm concentrating on my record production right now Um, and Basically, after seeing all the comments, um, I'd like to thank all the people that understood that what I was saying was true. Sad but true, as Metallica said, sad but true, that people who you know for 46 years and your own brother would stab you in the back. But that's the world we live in. So is it only with Bruce that you really have this conflict right now of interest? Obviously, the Kulik brothers are a 50-50 partnership. There are two of you, right? Only two of us. The last two left. So so there are no other parties involved in this dispute. Gene and Paul have nothing to do with it. Um, would that be an correct um, statement? I guess. I guess. Do you feel that Gene and Paul have have any side in this in, you know, preventing Bruce from working with you, um, developing the band into a project? Obviously, the 2017 cruise was massive. Yes, absolutely. Um, The real issue that started it all off was the cruise, Kids Cruise 8. My brother decided that the contract that said Bruce and Bob Kulik should only say Bruce Kulik. So he took care of that, sent me a contract with the signature space only for him, yet it represented me. I told him that I didn't think that horrible offer of what they offered us was fair for four people in airfare. And asked the lawyer who was involved to ask for more money. Instead, the guy completely disregarded his fiduciary duties and stabbed me in the back by sending me a letter saying that since Bruce was in charge and the contract was in his name, I was fired and that they were going to get somebody to replace me. My brother went to Paul Stanley and said, my brother doesn't think this is enough money. The chump change that they offered me, $3,000, $4,000. These guys make $500,000 each on this cruise. I'm not gonna be insulted by their cheap offer. So Bruce went to Paul and said, my brother doesn't like the money. Paul said, fuck him, get somebody else, which he did. So are they to blame? Yes, they're to blame from the very beginning. I don't know who these people are. I don't recognize my brother anymore. He's been kissed. After being in this band for 10 or 11 years, he's nowhere near the same person. 
nowhere near. And the Paul Stanley, that was my best friend, who cried on my shoulder. The Gene Simmons, who I did the favor to of helping him out with Diana Ross. I don't know where those people went. I sure didn't see them last time I saw them. I saw two charlatans standing there looking like them, but they weren't the people that I knew. Okay, people change. Fair enough. I worked with these guys for 46 years and worked on 24 songs. To treat me like a piece of poop is unacceptable. I won't take that from them or anyone. I'm curious about your relationship in this, because obviously they hold the keys to the kingdom on everything that revolves around Good Planet Kiss. Um, you've all, of which you've I all... want no part of. Just to be clear, I want no part of this band anymore. Selling everything that I have to do with this band. I have 11 platinum records without their platinum records. I have a Grammy without using anything of theirs. I have a whole career without them. This is the way those people want to treat me. I no longer want to be a part of this, quote, family or history or whatever you want to call it. You have no respect for the people who you uh, work with. I spoke to another one of the KISS alumni yesterday who told me how he had to put a cease and desist on one of their records because they ripped him off of his songwriting. Yeah. Everyone has a story. The guy helping Gene with, the vault, he had a lovely story how he got fired and how Gene called the label and badmouthed him. Yeah, I can say all this because it's all true. It's all true. And that's the funny thing, people saying online, oh, he's making this up. You couldn't make this up. And to what end? To what end? You think I don't feel bad that my brother doesn't understand that family is more important than anything else? not worship of Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons and the almighty dollar. Seriously, pathetic situation. But is that really a new situation? I, I'm pretty sure I read somewhere, and do correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, because I don't want to misrepresent anything about your situation. Um, back during the reunion when you were working on Humanary Stew, that you'd wanted Gene and Paul involved in that Alice Cooper tribute, and that they weren't interested in doing anything, you know, to do you a favor back, you know, even after you'd uh, done them many favors over the previous, by then, you know, 25 years. You know, is this a festering yeah. situation? Well, let me straighten you out first. I didn't ask them to, to sing on the Alice Cooper tribute. I, I asked them to sing on my album, on the Skull album, on my album, my band's album. Background okay. vocals on one song, guys. Background vocals on one song. They were both on the phone on a conference call. Well, Bob, you know, we're really big again now. And, you know, we really don't feel that we could participate, you know, blah, 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 blah. So I went down there and played Ace Fraley on about... 10 songs, three albums, four albums, Creatures of the Night, Kiss Killers, Kiss Alive 2. Then there was Paul's record, the song that I wrote with Gene on Naked City. There's a whole bunch of stuff that I've done. And, it, you know, it just, it just again, it seems to me that Paul and Gene are very forgetful. You know, they don't realize who helped. I didn't have a non-disclosure agreement when I played on Kiss Alive 2. They have no signed contract. I didn't tell anybody because I'm, I'm a man of my word. Paul said to me, all right, you played on Larger Than Life and All American Man and uh, Rockin' in the USA on that set of recordings. You can't tell anybody. I was like, I, I, I know. I got it. You're my friend. I'm not going to tell anybody. So 46 years later, this is what I get. People treating me like I did nothing for them. Fans going, you're a recession guitar player. They did you a favor. Really? I'm the one who did the favor. I'm the one who didn't get paid. I'm the good guy in this, not these selfish guys. I'm tempering what I'm saying because I don't want anybody else to get upset that Bob Kulik had the audacity to take on Kiss. Well, you know what? I went to school with Gene. You know what? I auditioned before A. Spraley. You know what? I played on a whole bunch of great stuff. Great stuff. I'm a legend tonight, larger than life, down on your knees, danger, all that stuff. I didn't make a big fuss about playing on some of the stuff because they were minuscule solos. But now that everybody's like, well, what did you ever do? You're just a session guitar player for them. 
Really? You try that. See if you could be session guitar player for Kiss. Let's see it. Let's see if you could deal with that. But here's the truth. I work with Motorhead. They're nothing compared to that. Nothing compared to that. Lemmy Kilmister would eat Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley for breakfast. Seriously. But I worked with those guys and produced a Grammy award-winning track, the theme for Triple H, the game, God Rest, uh, excuse me, um, um, God Save the Queen. Those are all my recordings. Can kids compare to some of that? Sweet Victory, the song that Dave Isley and I did for SpongeBob, the hit song. Can kids compare to that? All of that? No, and obviously you've got you've got your history with Diana Ross, Diana Ross, Patti LaBelle, and uh, Alice Cooper, of course. My my brother thinks he's hot shit. Sending me emails saying the reason he's successful is blah 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 blah. He's a replacement guitar player in two bands. He replaced guitar players in Kiss. He replaced a guitar player in Grand Funk Railroad. I wouldn't be bragging about that if I was him. I wouldn't be bragging about it. Me, I won a Grammy. Me, I played on it. Number one hit single. Me, I have another song, Sweet Victory, that's about to be released with a name artist. Watch what happens then. Try number one with a bullet. Try another Grammy for Bob. So these people are insignificant to me. Uh, I love the audience. The fans are rabid fans. I've been playing guitar since I was 10 years old. It's a long time. I know what I'm doing. The only reason that I'm here is because I'm very talented and very modest. I could say stuff that would be totally correct any of you people work with Lou Reed or Patti LaBelle or John Cale or anybody like that, you're not old enough to have. I knew Jimi Hendrix. Show me some respect. Jimi Hendrix did. He was nice to me. He invited me to the party when he came back from England, a star. Me and about eight people from Greenwich Village at his hotel room, smoking joints and listening to music. Yeah, we didn't have cell phones then. We were human beings. We interacted amongst ourselves. No, there are no pictures. Nobody gave a shit about taking pictures. It was all about the experience. No, and I don't think anyone's going to question your resume, Bob, in any way, or question your opinions no, or your, your people, history. People have questioned it. You're nobody. You're an old man, has been. You're a session guitar player. Incorrect. I may be old, but that's incorrect. I'm as old as Gene and Paul, so if they're old, I'm old, okay? So that's where that's at. Yep. So as far as the rest goes, you are not showing me respect, saying I'm just a session guitar player and they did me a fucking favor. I did them the fucking favor. Let's get this straight. I did the favor, not them. They didn't call anybody else. They called me. Kiss Alive too. Kiss Killers. Preachers. I'm, I'm curious about this, these, these favors that you did for them. Obviously, you were the guy who came into those sessions. Were you paid for right, those sessions? Or, or, or was, was it strictly as a favor that uh, you came in, you played, you stayed quiet for decades about contributing to those albums? Um, but were you paid for that work or for, say, session work doing demos like Mr. Speed, which was on the box set? Well, I'll give you the example of Mr. Speed. So back in the day, you know, Gina Paul would call like, we're working up this song today. You want to come by and play some guitar and stuff, hang? It was a hang back then. We were friends. We would get together and hang out, make some music. So, yeah, we did Mr. Speed. It was really cool. Then all of a sudden, it's on the box set. I called Gene on the phone. Hey, congratulations on this. Can I get, like, a platinum record on this? Oh, I, I, I sure would think so, Bob. And then I'm like, so do I get paid for this? Shouldn't I be paid for this? Weren't you paid back in the day? You mean the hundred dollars that you gave me to come and hang out? I don't consider that pay. Well, what are you looking for, Bob? I just said, you know, a double scale session fee or whatever. You know, so he gave me the twelve hundred dollars or whatever it was. And that was that. But I had to ask and he had to say that he paid me. Really? The hundred dollars? So it was never about the money. Uh, you know, Creatures of the Night, um, Partners of Crime were both done at the same time. If I made three thousand or four thousand dollars for that whole week or ten days I was there, that would have been a lot. They didn't pay. 
they, they, it was basically union double scale, Kiss Alive 2, union double scale. And me, I'm not one of those guitar players or musicians that makes it last longer so they could make money. When I'm on, I'm on, and that's it. It might take five minutes. It might take five hours. You don't know. But the reality is those solos were done very quickly, very quickly. Because whatever they didn't like, I replaced. And after trying to sound like Ace, I realized that I really couldn't sound like Ace. His style is different than mine. And right. I punctuated that by doing those overbends that he would never play. Anybody who's a guitar player and knows any nuanced information about playing guitar would realize that he couldn't play that. Never has, never would. It's not part of his vocabulary. It's not a matter of good, bad, or indifferent. It's just a fact. So I played on those records, helped, helped cement his guitar hero status with some really good solos, and went on to be shunned by the band. Here's your thanks for helping us out on all those songs. So when we got up and played them on Kiss Cruise 7, yeah, they went nuts. Yeah, they went nuts. As well they should. Nowhere to run. Wow. I listened to it. It wasn't good. It was magic. And that's the real disappointment that these three musicians didn't realize that that was the magic band that Bruce and I, with Todd and uh, Brent Fitz, that that was the magic right there. And Todd and Brent wasting their time playing with Slash as backup players. What's going to happen to them in 30 years? I used to play guitar. Or, excuse me. I used to play bass for Slash. Yeah, and? And? There was a chance to have a band. These guys fucked it up. So I'm over it. You're over it, um, but in 2018, you were, you know, helping Gene with the vault, weren't you? You uh, Isn't some of your material on there? And I believe I bumped into you in Las Vegas at the vault event there. So you, you still had enough of a relationship with him at that time. Um, would that also be correct to say that you, you were still on friendly terms with him in 2018 um, in order to do the vault event? I've never, been, I've never been on unfriendly terms. This All this shit just started now because of what happened with my brother. That's why. Other than that, things were what they are. They're not my friends anymore. I send Paul my record. Does he listen to it? No, he can't listen to anybody else's stuff. Ask him why. It's called narcissism. <laughs> can't listen to your own friend's recording. How about listening to one song? Oh, I can't. I can't. I can't listen to anybody else's stuff. Yep. My friends, we used to listen to everything. We used to sit there and take this stuff apart. Let's listen to Boston. How did he get that guitar sound? Now... The conversation you had with me is, when I'm off stage, I don't want to know about anything. I'm, I'm a private person, and don't take it personally, but uh, see ya. <laughs> so I'm just saying, you know, he's their prerogative to be whatever kind of people that they want to be. So really, you know, people are going to go, oh, there he goes again, drowning, groaning and moaning and complaining and whining. You're asking me a question. I'm giving you an answer. You want me to lie? They're great people. It's all to the earth. <laughs> Look, I work with the band. They're a great band. The true sign of greatness is longevity. So you got to hand it to them. But as far as being nice people and repaying people who helped them along the way, not so much. My friend, Clive Franks, who worked with Elton John as a sound man, Elton John gave him a car, a house, bought him a house, and bought him a yacht. He bought him a car, a house, and a yacht. The sound man, Elton John. Ask him. That's called generosity. That's called paying it forward. That's called taking care of the people that helped you get there. Not firing them and then calling the label and bad mouthing them. That's what these guys do. And all the people that I know that work with them, 90% of them had issues with Kiss that they had to put cease and desist or threaten to sue them or sue them. Not me, but all these other people. Interesting to hear that people that I had no idea would have lawsuits with them, had lawsuits with them. Yeah. But have you ever thought of going the same route as, say, uh, a Steve Hunter, you know, who's um, obviously done ghost work in a similar sort of context to you on Alive 2 and was able to claim back, you know, performance uh, royalties on those songs that he performed on eventually? What songs did Steve Hunter perform on? With uh, with Aerosmith, I'm talking uh, Train Kept a Rolling. Oh, Aerosmith. Oh, Aerosmith. I had no idea. Who did he get the money from? Aerosmith. Well, they're human beings, then they pay him, didn't 
Oh, they didn't. They had to get it through the industry. But, you know, I was always curious about that situation, whether you ever received royalties from these performances. You know, and obviously, no, I, he, I can't he, speak to any of these no. things that you are telling us, you know, because they're all your experiences. Yeah, and, you know, it's not about the business then like it is now. It was about the music. It was about the music. Jimi Hendrix and all those people were only about the music. And that's why you see the debacle of their business affairs. The James Brown movie, Dan Aykroyd tells him clearly, show business. You got the show, dude, but you need to let me handle the business. I had managers. I had lawyers. I had agents. I had all of it. So much stuff fell through the cracks because it was all happening so fast. Look at my discography. Look who I work with. All of that happened very quickly. Alice Cooper, Meatloaf, Lou Reed, Kiss, Wasp, Motorhead. All of it was just bang, zoom. It was just all over. And dotting the I's and crossing the T's was not the most important thing. Somebody said they needed a theme for a wrestler. I didn't say prepare the contract. And when it's ready, I'll get started. I just got started. Because I'm working with Lemmy and people like that. It was a joy. Not like, a, oh, God, what have I gotten myself into? Like every time I'd have to go play with kids. It was just like, geez, take a Valium. <laughs> so what would be your advice then to people? You found yourself in a situation today, and I don't know what your 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 well, end today, goal is. Today, well, today that couldn't happen because of cell phones and stuff like that. I would have walked out of the studio playing on their stuff and posted a video with a photo of me playing on it, wouldn't I? <laughs> yeah. We didn't have cell phones then. No, but uh, when go back that. for uh, for Kiss Cruise. Can I Kiss have a Cruise. picture of us, Gina Paul? Can I have a picture with us for posterity? Uh, I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about the music. I was thinking about now you'll know what you would have sounded like with me. Way better. Way more musical. It is what it is. So where do you want to go with this press that you're getting? I mean, obviously your story is now all over the internet. Gene and Paul and Bruce and everyone is very much aware of the situation. Is this just a vent at this point because you know nothing can be resolved? Or do you hope for some resolution in some way that can lead you forward and feeling satisfied with a resolution? I hope there was a resolution. That would be great. I, I, I know these people too well. There won't be a resolution. There won't be. I'm fine. I'm recording an album right now with an all-star cast of people, real musicians. Billy Gibbons, Doug Pinnock, Greg Bizanet, Tony Franklin, Ruby Sarzo, Dora Pesh, a whole bunch of great people that I'm working with right now on my next Christmas record. Doug Aldrich is going to play. Michael Anthony's up next. A whole bunch of great people. Joe Hoekstra played. George Lynch played. My friends. These are all my friends. They're not in KISS. They have other things that they do. I work with all of them on numerous records. There'll be 45 or 50 different people on here. Yeah, all my friends. All this bullshit about Crazy Bob and all of this stuff. Yeah, crazy like a fox. Any of you have a record deal? No, you don't. I have record deals with real labels. Because I'm a Grammy award winning producer that knows what he's doing, who knows all of these musicians who are my friends because I either played with them or produced them. So that's what I'm doing. This is just a. People need to know the truth. I find it apparent that people are just like, oh, he's got to air his dirty laundry in public. No, this is informational. Informational. This is what the music business is like. This is what it's like. You think you want to be in the music business? Try this. Try this. See if you can handle Motorhead. See if you can handle Blackie Lawless. See if you could deal with Diana Ross. See if you could hang with Paul and Gene and tell them to their faces, you guys are morons. You don't know what you're talking about. My brother can shave his mustache and be in your band, which I actually had to stay in. He's got a mustache. You can't have them in the band. Wow. Seriously. Seriously. Are you are you concerned that um, this this I mean, conversation? 
Uh, no, no, no. I don't think the Cleveland lot are still in the in the picture. Um, that you're going to be ostracized by the Kiss community, and obviously, I sat next to you at the Kiss Cruise Eight, uh, your table, and you were doing gangbusters business with the fans, uh, photographs, yeah. signings, and all of that. It was it was wonderful to see, actually. But are you are you concerned that you're going to be cut out of expos, appearances, or is all of that just not really? It's you know, it's just worth it as collateral damage. Uh, uh, you know, again, I, I love the fans in the audience. The, the fact that they would spend time either writing stuff that was insulting or, or writing stuff that was flattering. I'm a big fan of yours. I know where you work. I feel bad that this has happened to you. There was a lot of that. There was a lot of people writing that. I stopped looking after a while. I mean, I produced that Sin Sinatra record. I did metal versions of Sinatra songs using the best singers on the planet, Glenn Hughes, Devin Townsend, uh, Joey Belladonna, Robin Zander, Dee Snyder, Doug Pinnock. These were the singers on that record. I saw reviews for this. Somebody said, you got to go see the review of Devin Townsend's version of New York, New York. So I went to the page, and there it was. Come in. Greatest version of New York, New York ever. I was like, wow, that's that's so amazing to see somebody write that. Made me feel like a million dollars. The next comment, whoever did this should be shot. <laughs> okay, so I see. I, I see what I'm dealing with here. Don't look. The comments that are flattering, I don't need anybody to tell me that I'm good. The proof's in the pudding. The millions of records that I was involved in that sold. I don't need anybody to go, yeah, you know what? You can play. I know that, and I'm not saying that in an egotistical way, all those comments. He's so egotistical, all he does is talk about himself. Well, if I'm doing the interview, who am I going to talk about? You want me to talk about Donald Trump? What do you want me to talk about? No, anyway, I mean, in, in the music business, you have to be egotistical anyway because of what you're doing. So I, I, I don't understand well, where that, that would be coming from. Combination, it's a nasty combination of ego and insecurity. The insecurity is. Massive. Anybody that says they're not scared when they go out there to play is a liar. You can't do it without that. Without that adrenaline. Without that, go out there and kill it. Anybody that says otherwise is a liar. There's never been a show that I ever did that I wasn't scared until I got up there and got into it. And then you're in your moment. You're in your element. This is what you do. But like a baseball player, you have no idea what's going to happen. No idea. Now, as opposed to the old days. I fell on my ass on the stage. There's no video of it. I tripped over a monitor playing a big place with meatloaf. Blammo, down I went, like a ton of bricks. There's no video or photos of that. Now, now, there'd be 20 versions of it. Here's the front view, look at his face. Oh, here's where his head hits the stage. Seriously, to get up there and play now with people not interested in the music, interested in photo bombing themselves in the band. Here I am in front of the band. That's not the way to watch music. Guys playing with inner ears. It's not the way to make music. It's all changed. I'm old school, I guess. But I'll tell you this, all of the recordings that I did back in the day, none of them needed fixing. I have them all now. Dealing with all of that now. All of those people who are no longer with us that I recorded, Lemmy, Ronnie Dio, Jimmy Bain, Randy Castillo, Sirens Clemens, Pat Torpy, Ronnie Montrose. All those people are gone. They're on all these recordings that I did back in the day. Their performances are organic performances. Nobody chopped up Pat Torpy or Randy Castillo's drums and made them work. Nobody had to fix Ronnie Montrose's solo. They didn't. Nobody had a have Lemmy sing 10 times to make a comp of it or Ronnie one take Charlie want to do one more for shits and giggles other than that put that up on the grid now listen to those notes they don't need fixing talent now everybody's like can you fix that can you fix that can you move that not real music no no not like the old days where people played organically 
You either had it or you didn't, period. Now what I see is nothing but shit and piss. That's what I see. Are there great artists out there? Yeah. And Lady Gaga and people like that are as great as anybody that ever did it. She's got the magic, that one. There's a few that have the magic. Metallica still got the magic. There's some bands out there that still have the magic, but most of it, the oldies routine, it's so sad. It's really sad. I don't want to get up there and play in an oldies band. I don't. I prefer being in the studio with my friends. But would uh, the Kulik brothers have been able to have toured together, you know, fiscally, um, you know, would the finances have worked in this day and age to take that out on the road? If you look at that Ace Can't pull more than a few hundred into clubs these days, was was that a concern for you, that it was not really viable? And I don't know one way or the other. I no, it was viable. Is- no, au contraire. It was viable because we had offers. I have a representative in Europe. And he had viable offers on the table. I spoke to several labels, and they were amenable. Uh, you guys want to record the set that you did on the boat? We could just record that and put that out. Okay, well, that's an option. How about some original material? How about, you know, the options were open. Brent and Todd were available when they weren't working with Flash. My brother, he was the barricade. He had a meeting with the rep from Europe, and basically said, well, I hope you can help Bob out because uh, I'm too busy. Too busy to take the magical opportunity of having the A-band, having the audience tell you after one gig, the only gig that, you know, the indie gigs were like, I I didn't feel the vibe there uh, like I felt on the boat. We got up there. I had no idea what was going to happen. We were the guinea pigs. They set us up to fail. The first band to play electric, have to go on after Kiss. Lovely. Great. No rehearsal, no sound check, no spare guitars, no roadies. Set up to fail. What did we do? The music gods looked down and said, ye shall kill. And kill and, we did. And you did. Look at that. Just look at it. Look at the video of that performance. No rehearsal, no sound check, no nothing. Think if we'd spend a month in a room working up some material. Think if we'd rehearsed and gone out and did 50 shows, there wouldn't be a band on this planet that could touch us. Todd Kearns is one of the best singers I ever heard, and him and Brent together make a formidable rhythm section. And my brother and I, there ain't two guitar players on this planet that could touch us, because as brothers, the, the connection of our minds is not conscious, it's unconscious. And that's why people hearing us play without really spending much time on getting it together. Nothing was lost when he switched to a solo when I played with him and vice versa. Why? Because we're both monster players, that's why. And so the audience was denied seeing this now two years in a row. Shame on my brother, thinking that they would just like him better than hearing the both of us. Well, there are probably people that feel that way. That's fine. I'm not one of them. How do you heal that connection with Bruce? A musical connection, dude. I taught him how to play. I turned him on to Jimi Hendrix and all those people. He's four years younger. He was Gaga Goo Goo when I was playing guitar. I was in Greenwich Village hanging out with Jimi Hendrix and Pepe Castro and James Taylor and Danny Cooch and John Sebastian and the guys that were in the village in 1968 when I was 18 years old. My brother was 14. He was home Gaga Goo Goo. He never saw any of that. All he did was hear about it from me. I don't know anybody that's set me. I just happened to be around. I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time. If I didn't live in New York, none of that would have happened. Wouldn't have gone to the same high school as Jane, wouldn't have met Jimi Hendrix, none of that would have happened. But this is what happened, and it's not an accident. It's design. It's divine design. Divine design. I know you said on the Metal Voice on an interview that you did with them that now that your parents have, are gone, your mom... Uh, wouldn't have been very happy with this situation between you and Bruce. Um, I, I think what fans like me would really like to know, Bob, is how do you, how does the relationship with Bruce get healed and repaired after all of this? It's a good question. You have to ask him since he no longer allows me to speak to him by having a restraining order and very distasteful. 
Uh, I'm a really open, kind, sharing person. Uh, possessions don't mean that much, much to me. I've moved so many times. I just move on. But my brother has a, a bunch of things that uh, are very personal to me. Uh, my toys as a child. Um, I never did get to see my parents' will. And I uh, gave him one of my left Pauls back in the day for like $1,000. This is uh, here. Have something that you can sink your teeth into. This is a really great guitar. And the guitar's worth probably $100,000 now. Has he given me an extra penny? No. Mutt Lang bought a guitar from Billy Duffy. Uh, oh, Les Paul, you know, gave him $4,000. The guitar turned out to be worth like $200,000. Mutt Lang gave him the difference. That's the right thing to do. My brother can't even do the right thing because he's been kissed. Would Paul Stanley do that? He wouldn't give anybody any money. It'd be like too bad. So this is what it is. As distasteful as it is, this is the truth. Why would I make this up? Why? Do you regret any comments that you've made uh, during the situation about Lisa or, you know, ab about Bruce himself? Or do, or do you uh, really feel those statements that you made? Well, I don't recall having an interview about Lisa. But I didn't really say anything that bad about my brother. He needs to own what he is. That's all. It's a brutal business. So let's give him the excuse. It's a brutal business and literally everybody out there is fighting for their lives. The big joke is everybody thinks that people like him or me or whatever are rich. You know, you look online and they got the, the estimate of how much you're worth. Oh, he's worth $2.3 million. Oh, he's worth $4.8 million. You know how they come up with that figure? They just make it up. Yep. <laughs> Donald Trump's right about that. There is fake news. There is fake news on all sides. For me to have to read shit about me, that's like, well, that's totally untrue. If I'm an old man, how is it I can play on a, a A men's division league softball team? I'm an in shape guy. Like I was talking to Doug Pinnock the other day. Here's a guy, 0% body fat. He just sang on my Christmas record. A phenomenal artist. He's my age. He's Dean's age. He's Paul's age. Zero percent body fat. Six one, 136 pounds. Doug Pinnock. Superstar. God. The guy's a god. You hear him sing now? He sings better now than he ever did. So some people, they just have the magic. But as far as being old, <laughs> Gene and Paul are old then. So how come, what's the difference between me and them? I, I don't, you know, I didn't say anything about Lisa in any of these interviews. So, you know, if, if there was something that was said in a personal comment to somebody online on a night where I had to read stuff that I really didn't want to read, you know, people's lack of understanding of anything. Like, well, why didn't she get a lawyer first? I was dealing with my brother. Do I really need a lawyer to, get, to make T-shirts with my brother? Well, how come you didn't sign the contract first? I didn't think it was necessary under the circumstances. I know better now. This is the second time that my brother approved of something in paper, uh, on paper, the Kiss Cruise committing me to something that I had no signature uh, to add to with the contract. And then this, allowing people to use the merchandise without any signature from me or any payment or statement. And yet I shipped in to help get the copyright to do the actual T-shirts. People online. Oh, he didn't give him $750. They wouldn't need his $750. What do you know about it? That's the way it works. Just being honest. I'll post the payment to my brother if people want to see it. I have it. I just thought that would be distasteful to have to do that. But that's what people want. You know, I don't really want to fight about this. I just want the truth to be known. That's all. The truth is the truth. I I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Franklin Delano Roosevelt evidently knew that the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor. I argued with Lemmy about this. He knew 15 years ago. Now they made a movie about it. Did you know that? Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt knew that the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor? Yeah, it's been discussed. <laughs> they made a movie about it now. Yeah, years years ago there was a, a documentary about how much he knew beforehand. Yeah. So. Yeah, and Lemmy, Lemmy told me this 15 years ago and showed it to me in a book. I was like, really? So do we really ever know what's going on? No. And that's why most people making comments, you know what? 
learn from this. Respect your family. Value your brothers and your sisters and your parents. They're the only ones you have. My brother, unfortunately, taken a turn to the dark side. Why? I blame Paul and Jean. What, what the real reason is, you have to ask them. But I begged. I said, you know, this, this gets out. People are not going to look favorably upon this. We need to bury the hatchet. We never play again. I don't care. But we should at least make a, an attempt to be uh, brothers. They well, showed well, me how we felt about it. With the police calling me on the phone and then coming to the door and giving me a restraining order with the guy saying, sorry, here's a restraining order from your brother. By the way, I'm a big fan of yours. Thanks. Appreciate it. That's what happened. I guess from now on, since we live in this age, I should video all of it, then I can put that up. <laughs> so listen, I got to go to the studio and make some music. Good. Um, go make some music, Bob. And, and when you've got something to release, I want to talk to you again. Okay? Absolutely. Thank you for spending time listening to the KISS FAQ podcast today. All sales are final. There are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.